Welcome to the Jewish Leadership Conference sponsored by the Tikva Fund. We are here to discuss the Israeli elections and the future of Israeli conservatism. I'm here with my distinguished panel to my immediate right, Yaakov Katz. He's the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post and also author of the book Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, also a former advisor to Minister of Diaspora Affairs, Naftali Bennett, and also Ron Baratz, who is the founder of the conservative Hebrew language news site Mida and a columnist for Mikor Rishon, and also previously served as Director of Communications in Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office. Uh, welcome. Thank so you. we are now here um, just a few days before the fourth Israeli election in a period of about two years. And once again, we see that the polls show that Benjamin Netanyahu is sitting on the edge, on the borderline of being able to form a coalition with his preferred political partners. Uh, Yaakov, what do you think is going to happen this coming week? Well, it, it's very difficult to predict, Alex, uh, exactly what's going to happen. But I think what's, what's very interesting in this upcoming election on March 23rd is the fact that I think for the first time in a long time, when you look at the breakdown of what the Knesset's going to be based on the polling that we have until now, you see pretty much an 80-40 split. 80 is going to the right, 40 is going to the left, or including obviously the Arab party or parties, uh, depending if the small faction Ram passes the threshold. But uh, why is that significant? Because that's a huge block. If you think about it for a moment, and you take the personalities out of the equation, 80 seats in the Knesset for, by right-wing ideologues potentially could change Israel forever, right? I mean, they could pass all these laws that they've spoken about from West Bank annexation of Israeli communities, settlements in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank. They could do uh, reforms, judicial reforms that they've spoken about, religious reforms, what have you, right? But what's the problem? What's the catch? Is that out of the 80, there's so many of them who won't sit with Netanyahu. So if Netanyahu has about 27, 28, 29, based on whatever poll you're looking at, uh, he has the ultra-Orthodox parties, which are about 15 that will sit with him, so you're already about 45. And that's it, right? Naftali Bennett, with his 10, 11, 12, 13 seats, depending also on the poll, won't say he'll sit with him, won't say he won't sit with him. And then you have Gidon Sar, you have Yisrael Beitenu, Avigdor Lieberman. Uh, you have all these other parties that are right wing, and we could argue whether they really are right wing or not, but they're not going to be sitting with, with Netanyahu. So you actually have this massive block, but because of political personalities and identity politics, it can come together and coalesce to be the movement that it has the potential to be. And what would happen if Netanyahu was unable to form a block of at least 61 seats with his preferred right wing partners? Well, the question then becomes, does the other side, the so-called anti-Netanyahu camp, have an alternative government in their hands? And that's unclear based on polling. It's also unclear whether Naftali Bennett, who's something of like the kingmaker in this upcoming election, would be willing to sit in a government. He's already said, I won't sit under Yair Lapid from the Ishatid as the prime minister. He, they've already said they won't sit with Meretz, which is the very far left uh, party. So what exact government would be on that other side is difficult to see how that comes together. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have a government and Netanyahu doesn't have a government, then there's one clear solution, which we've sadly already been through. This is going to be our fourth time, and that's called a fifth election. And I hope we don't get there, but it's possible. Well, Ron, we see, as Yako says, that there might be 75 to 80 seats worth of right-wing parties. Netanyahu might not be able to piece together a coalition of at least 61. What does the right-wing lose by being unable to form a majority government? Well, first of all, I have to say, I, uh, I don't define parties being right or left by statements or even ideologies. For me, it's politics. If you are not willing to sit in a right-wing government, then you are not right-wing, even if you declare yourself so. So for me, it's a, I don't see those 80 uh, mandates. I think the voters might be more right-wing than actually the politicians. And it's not exactly identity politics, it's personal politics. We will not sit with Netanyahu, regardless of any ideology, regardless of any policies you might uh, you want, want to uh, uh, advance, you will not sit with him personally. This is a, and this is a very strange thing that has happened. Another thing that has happened, usually right-wing parties that competed with the Likud said that they are right to the Likud, right? They are more right-wing than the Likud. This is the first time, actually, both Bennett and Sal 
they run towards the center. They say we are actually more closer to the center than the Likud. So this is, another, this is a real shift in Israeli politics, and no one knows. That's why it's a real mystery what will happen uh, two weeks from now. What the right wing stands to lose, I, I think, has mostly to do with what happens in the American government, what happens in the White House, what happens in the State Department, because they are going to shift back to a kind of Obama policy, the days of, of Obama vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East, and there I think it's m crucial that we have a right wing government. Well, just to explain to some of the people that might be in America, we talk about right-wing government, left-wing government. In the past, right-wing used to be defined by your feelings toward the creation of a Palestinian state, a two-state solution with regard to the uh, keeping or uh, disengagement from settlements. It seems today that the majority of Israelis recognize that the settlements are here to stay and that there is no credible partner for peace, such that a two-state solution is not going to happen in the short-term period. So what are the issues really that separate right and left in Israeli politics, Yaakov? Well, I mean, that's a fascinating, very important question, because when Prime Minister Netanyahu, for example, warns of the rise of the left, right, Yair Lapid, left-wing government, what exactly is he warning of? What will this so-called left-wing government do that his government's not doing, or his what will they not do that his government's not doing, right? And 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 because traditionally, when we thought of right versus left, we thought about okay, one government's willing to advance uh, territorial concession to the Palestinians to grant them an independent state, and the other government's not willing to do that, right? But that's no, that's not on the table. That's neither here nor there, right? Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu, who were in this so-called unity government that fell apart. There was no real difference, you could say, on that issue specifically, on security, on, on diplomatic affairs. They pretty much saw eye to eye. But where where did things start to get blurry? So here, and, and this, I think, is, is what's unfortunate when you have a prime minister who's on trial and under investigation is everything that falls under the rule of law category or the judicial reforms, right? And here is where things start to get uh, complicated because Netanyahu could push from a right-wing position, we have to enact judicial reforms, right? We have to merge the attorney general's roles. We have to create a different way of the way we select judges or the, the, the whole process and checks and balances between the courts and the Knesset. That's all important, in my opinion. The question comes down to whether it should be done by someone who is under on trial or under investigation. I think that a lot of the resistance to that was because of his personal issues, less because of the larger uh, question of what type of reforms are really needed. Then there's religion and state. There's other issues, but I think that's one of the big ones. Ron, what do you think are the major distinctions between right and left in Israeli yeah, politics? So I, I, uh, I don't think the, the tri Netanyahu's trials are really the issue because obviously any kind of judicial reform will not have to do with the trial. That's uh, You can take that for granted. Uh, major, I think there are still... there. Huge differences, you just don't uh, see them as clearly because the left didn't have power in the last uh, 12 years. But uh, I think there's a huge economic difference. I think fiscal responsibility, uh, once the left gets power, actually Lapid said so. So he's going to spend a lot of money by increasing Israel's debt, which is something Netanyahu was very strict not doing in his 12 years. Of course, every prime minister can do that. They can uh, you know, lower fis fiscal responsibility and spend money on the public. But so this is a, a major issue. But I think the more crucial issue is how do you handle American policy? So uh, you can see what Netanyahu did uh, under uh, Obama's eight years. And I think had w if we had a left-wing government at that time, we would accept Obama's policy. They would comply. They would say, what is the major difference? Netanyahu and then Trump said, Iran is the most important issue. The Palestinians are secondary to the Iranian threat globally over the, the entire Middle East. And the left reverses that and they think they agree. I think what, what Biden is going to say and what Obama said, the first and foremost issue is the Palestinian, the conflict between Israel and, and the Palestinians, and Iran is secondary. And I think this is a major shift. And ha if we have a left-wing government, then you would see that they would accept that policy or doctrine. Although that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, Biden has not said that. And that hasn't that hasn't yet yeah, become but the case. We have, we have signals. I'm not saying it won't happen. But we have signals from uh, from the administration that this is where it's headed. And we also have signals, I mean, not that I'm defending them, but we also have signals from the administration that so far they're not making any concessions to Iran 
on ahead of nuclear talks, although uh, we also a, should be concerned about nuclear this, talks. At this point of the transition of, uh, of governments, I think the most telling signal is who do you appoint to what uh, kind of role to play uh, in the government. And I think those signals are pretty clear that Palestinian issues are going to come back and some sort of pacification towards Iran, uh, uh, on the other hand. Right. We've seen that the a large number of the appointments made by the Biden administration consists of authors and negotiators of the JCPA, the Iran nuclear deal. And so obviously Israel is concerned that the Biden administration will try to rush back into some form of that agreement, whether it changes or not. Now, the important thing is the attitude, right? The Iranians see pacification as a sign of weakness and so an acknowledgement of their own power. So what they deduce from that is that they have to be more powerful and more aggressive because it works. So this is, I think, the kind of uh, what, what I worry is going to happen. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu was clearly an opponent of the Iranian nuclear deal. He went to Congress in 2015, uh, spoke against the deal and which very much angered President Obama at the time. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu would say that that speech was actually a turning point that led towards the ability to create these normalization agreements uh, in the Gulf with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, and has really changed the balance of power in the Middle East. At the same time, Yair Lapid, who's the primary opponent now of Netanyahu, says that that speech uh, hurt Israel's ability to maintain bipartisan support in the United States and also created or exacerbated a rift with American Jewry, uh, is it one, is it the other, uh, or is it both? Well, I think it's a combination of everything. I think there's, a, there's truth on both sides. There's no question, in my mind at least, that Netanyahu's strong stance against the Iranian nuclear threat and being at the forefront of it is what uh, helped propel the relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Bahrain, so the Saudis, and, and more. And also put him in, a, in when, when, when Donald Trump comes to office, and wins the election of 2016, walks into the White House, and he looks around and he says, who, who stood against this JCPOA deal? Was it Mitch McConnell? Was it, you know, was it, what, was it Rand Paul? No, it was Benjamin Netanyahu, the leader of, of Israel. And I think that that also created a, a stronger connection between the two. But, but, but there's no doubt that, forget about angering Obama, which definitely that speech in, before Congress did, it angered the entire Democratic establishment and turned Israel and, uh, and created a wedge between Israel and, and the large swath of American Jews who vote and lean to the democratic side of things. Um, and, and that is something that has yet to be repaired. And I think, you know, any one of us who talks to a democratic member of Congress today hears from him or her how uh, that speech and what that did in the insult to their president. Um, the question also comes down to, but so yes, there was that after effect, but the, the, the side effect of the normalization agreements, but the, the speech did not succeed in stopping the deal. The deal went ahead. And we also have to look at where we are today. Donald Trump did pull out of the deal. The deal was a terrible deal. Donald Trump pulled out of the deal, but Iran continued ahead with their nuclear program. And today is farther ahead than they used to be. So today we need a, a solution, maybe even on a more urgent level than we needed it back in 2015. And I think that that's why, where, however you look at it, there's some truth on, to both sides of this uh, question. So... Uh it's, uh, I think, almost undoubtable, although, uh, you know, the official records uh, will be sealed for uh, many years that uh, the speech, Netanyahu's speech in Congress facilitated uh, the formation of an uh, anti-Iran coalition in the Middle East. It was kept secret. It was under the table for a few years. And what Trump actually did was he facilitated, you know, making it formal, formalizing those agreements, which is a huge step. When I was in office, I used to ask the, the people who advised Bibi on, on the Middle East to say, if you have some sort of relation with an Arab nation, why don't you come forward? And he said, if we, if we have one, one formal step forward, we'll have a hundred steps backwards in the informal conversations and informal agreements. And what Trump did was actually make them formal without paying any cost. Arab leaders today acknowledge Israel. They take Israel's sides on, on certain issues and they are part of a coalition with Israel. This is a, a huge shift in the Middle East. East and uh, in the balance of powers in the Middle East. And I think it's so strong that even the Biden administration will have to take that into account, that currently they do not face Israel versus the Arab world. There is a coalition that is partly Israeli and other Arab powers in the region versus vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Iran's growing power in the region. So this is a major shift. And I think if that speech got 
as closer to the position we are today, it was definitely worth every second of it. You know, in American elections, Bill Clinton famously said, it's the economy stupid, right? The, the whole issue is the economy. In Israel, over the years, it's kind of been something different, which is it's security stupid, right? So today, Israel and Iran are engaged in an asymmetric conflict. You almost have what you could call the Israeli-Iranian conflict today. Uh, we know that uh, Iranian proxies like Hezbollah have over 150,000 rockets pointed at Israel. Perhaps Iran has just uh, tarred the entire Israeli coastline. We're, we don't know yet, but there are rumors that this is might be environmental terrorism. Israel's obviously taking actions against Iran in Syria and even within Iran itself. Yeah. Uh, how serious is this issue in the sense that will Israel be involved in a conflict with Iran that is an open conflict? And does racing back into the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal, does that make an open conflict more likely? I think it's possible, but we're already in an open conflict the way I look at it, at least, right? The fact that we, we, you don't see Israel necessarily attacking Iran doesn't mean that there's not a conflict between Israel and, and Iran. We see it playing out all the time on the border between Israel and Syria. We see Israel's airstrikes in Syria. We see Israeli action, uh, also covert, but reports of Israeli attacks in places like Iran itself. But primarily, the, the, the Israel is attacking Iranian targets all the time in Syria against Iranian entrenchment there. And I think that adding on what Ron was just talking about, yes, the speech might have, and I, and I agree, was probably what helped bring together. I don't know if it was worth every single second of it because of the rift with the Democrats. With the Democrats. But uh, I think there's also, if you look around the world today, there's only one country that is actively fighting the Iranians on a daily basis. And it's not the Americans, and it's not the Russians, definitely. It's not the Emiratis, it's not the Saudis. It's uh, it's Israel, and Israel's doing it all the time, right? Uh, there's not a week that goes by that we don't hear of an airstrike in, in, in somewhere inside Syria. And I think that, that that shows that Israel has the, you know, puts its missiles where its mouth is, right, in that sense. Uh, but when you look at the larger nuclear um, program, Right. The 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 fact of the matter is that Israel is the only country in the world that has not once but twice taken action to take to remove and eliminate an enemy's nuclear program in 1981 in Iraq and 2007 in Syria. So definitely a possibility that that could happen once again with Iran. Is this an issue, though, that Israelis are voting on? Are they voting on who will keep Israel safe against the Iranian threat or are there other issues? Uh, First of all, I think sure, but I, I want to add something to what Yaakov said. I agree with the, with most of what you said. What I'm amazed at is how the West is willing to accept Iran, a nation that openly declares that they, their target, their aim, their historical goal is to destroy Israel. I mean, they, they wouldn't accept any other nation that says something like that, except the Iranian case and it versus Israel. It's amazing to me to see that. And all the, all the time, you know, I, uh, I, I was attacked very harshly for uh, saying this is a, some sort of more than anti-Semitism in the sense that they are tolerant of views that they would have been completely intolerant in any other case. So I think that there's a bias here that you have to uh, somehow define nuanced in a nuanced way. In terms but, of, the, of the Israeli... Well, one second, before we pivot to that issue then, is America a reliable ally for the United States? Obviously, Trump was perhaps Netanyahu's greatest ally. Yeah. A Biden administration might not be. Is America a reliable ally going forward for Israel? I think if you look at... I'm sure that the Israeli administration right now is thinking of scenarios in which we would have to act alone or with you know some sort of a Middle East coalition that is being formed and assuming that the Americans will not be willing to uh, you know put their missiles where their mouth is in in the case of the Iranian nuclear program right so now you have an issue where the security threat to Israel is potentially very great uh, Israel's relationship with its largest and most powerful ally uh, is coming into question. Are Israelis voting on which prime minister would have the ability to deal with these threats uh, to the best ability, or are there other issues? So because of uh, the coronavirus, of course, has shifted the conversation both to the uh, more to economics and health. So obviously, many Israelis, what, this is what they're thinking about, and the vaccination program is, uh, is an issue that uh, makes them vote. And the question, who is going to tackle the economy, economic crisis that, uh, that we face uh, and the world faces? 
But I think many people would vote for Netanyahu, at least in part, do that out of some, some sort of confidence that they have in him to make sure, as he promises, that Iran will not go nuclear during his term. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> go ahead. Please. I think I think that uh, I think definitely Corona now is probably extremely up there. The vaccination campaign. I think that Netanyahu wanted, for example, the normal the Abraham Accords to be front and center. He wanted to travel to Abu Dhabi a number of times, and each time it got canceled. He wasn't able to get that photo op with MBZ. Um, or maybe even MBS, the BB, MBZ, MBS uh, summit that they were trying to put together. But, um, but I mean, you know, what, what, what Netanyahu has going more for him at the end of the day is, yes, you know, the, the, who can, I don't know if it's who can stand up to Iran, but it's more of just, he's the known commodity. We know that he keeps us safe. And the truth of the matter is, to his credit, with all of the criticism I might have, Israel today is, is safer than it's ever been, right? Israel, less Israelis, and it's in the data, less Israelis today and over the last bunch of years are getting killed than they were getting killed in previous, uh, under pre previous prime ministers. And in I think the that, entire history of Israel. Correct. And I think that that has a lot to his credit. But I mean, you know, in an interview we did with him recently, he was asked, what, what does he want his legacy to be? And the first and foremost, uh, the first thing he said is protector of Israel. But the second thing is lib liberator of the economy. But I, de you know, I, I definitely think that you can call him something of a protector of, of the state of Israel. And I think it's hard for Israelis to see that someone else could protect them. Even maybe they could, but it's difficult to imagine it. Ron, what's the gap between Netanyahu's ability to handle the security, the diplomatic and the economic threats and the others that are competing for his job? What's the, the skill level gap there? So no, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a fair question to ask me because I see a huge gap, but obviously many Israelis think that uh, th those candidates can replace him. But ne Netanyahu has some sort you know, of... Uh, People who, uh, who think that the trends are good, they tend to be more conservative. They want to keep what they have rather than, you know, Saar and Bennett, they uh, run on a campaign of change. We need to change, we need to change. But you have to be in some sort of stress to want to change. And I think many Israelis actually think that Netanyahu did a good job in security, pretty good job in economics, and there are things that we need to improve. So what we need to do is get him on that wagon rather than replace him and, you know, threaten the uh, security achievements and economic achievements. So in that sense, Netanyahu has, uh, uh, I would say, that working for him. But of course, he also faces uh, a personal attack that's been going through since he joined politics, basically. And uh, the trial uh, issues uh, that present him as someone who uh, is charged with taking bri a bribe, uh, things that I think are ludicrous. It's ridiculous. The, the files, I think, are uh, completely, uh, you know, should have been thrown out of court long ago. But it has some sort of effect on the public opinion and the people who oppose him. And that facilitates a, uh, a need, but, uh, or at least uh, some sort of uh, belief in uh, some Israeli public uh, opinion that we need to change. I think what will happen is that uh, at least in the three to five years after Netanyahu, it will be uh, pretty chaotic and uh, the transition will be pretty uh, difficult because Netanyahu is so well-centered in Israeli politics for more than a decade. And po politics revolves around him being the prime minister, making the tough decisions, you know, uh, and pursuing what he thinks are the most important goals. It will be a very hard dif and difficult term to, uh, after he's gone, whenever that happens. I think, I mean, you know, I think that Netanyahu has an intellectual depth that is unparalleled today on the political landscape of Israel and among his contenders, right? With that said, and vast experience, with that said, there's a huge problem and a huge deficit right now on, on two levels. The first is the trial, right? Which we can't just put, throw away or it, 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 it's huge and it's, and it's important. And what it does is it undermines and it taints every single decision that he makes from the government that he formed together with Benny Gantz, signed in a coalition agreement that he would pass a, a two-year budget it violated the agreement, did not stand by his agreement, every step of the way undermined the coalition agreement, all for the purpose of trying to find an exit from that coalition agreement that would have put Benny Gantz and had him rotate and become prime minister. And you see these decisions constantly going on. So at a time of great economic uncertainty for the state of Israel, due to the coronavirus, not to have a state budget, not to have a state budget for the IDF with the threats that it faces and has to prepare for looming on the horizon is, is, is complete negligence, in my opinion, and, and is the main problem 
of what we have today with the prime minister who's standing trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. At the same time, I think what the coronavirus also showed us was that Netanyahu, and you know, just as someone who's followed him and, and, and covered him as a reporter for the last you know, two decades, pretty much, is someone who is, is amazing diplomat, statesman, orator, and, and knows how to get stuff done one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's how you can look at it, the vaccination campaign. Very good at making those deals with Pfizer. But when it came to managing a governmental national crisis, he didn't know how to work with other people. He didn't know how to work with when Naftali Bennett was the defense minister and said, let the IDF take responsibility. Became a personal fight. When Benny Gantz came in and said, let's form this coalition agreement, became a personal fight. The whole, every step of the way from closing the airports to the to, to enforcement of the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox community, which was violating those, those the, the, the restrictions, every step of the way, it just wasn't managed well. And, and I think that, the, that these are two problems that we have right now. And there, there are some two uh, aspects of what you're saying. One is management and the other is the personal. Correct. So, you know, it's a little bit, uh, to me, it's strange to hear that the prime minister who served the longest term as prime minister in the history of, of Israel, people actually believe that he's uh, not good at working with other people. He's very he's excellent with working with other people. There are political issues, political interests that are at play that make other players say, you know, we, we have a fight, we can't agree on anything. I think it would have been a mistake. I wrote about it to, uh, to make the IDF responsible for the health crisis. It would have been a disaster. I think Netanyahu was completely right. But Bennett, out of, out of his own political interests, mm -hmm. made, made it personal because it helped him. So Netanyahu knows very well how to work with people, including people who have attacked him vehemently in the, in the past. So for the past few years, Netanyahu has not been able to form a government with his preferred partners. And even if you look back earlier in his term as prime minister, he hasn't exactly been able to form that right wing government that he would like. Uh, what has Israel lost by not having the preferred government or at least the government without the internal conflict on the day to day? And what could Netanyahu accomplish if he was able now to form a strong right wing government moving forward? Ron. Well, I think the coming years are uh, going to be tainted by, they're going to be painted by two major issues. One is the Middle East, and that has a lot to do with how we face uh, the American administration. And the other is recovering from the corona epidemic. If we will recover, we don't know. You know, it's still an unknown. There might be new strains, there might be uh, new viruses. We, we have to see wh what comes out of it. So these are the, the two major aspects that any government will have to deal with. And you know, Netanyahu might lose because the results are uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. And I think this this will have a huge cost. It's, it's not even right or left wing. The fact that we will have a completely inexperienced government facing those two major existential issues will be, uh, very, I don't know, it makes me worry uh, quite a bit. So Netanyahu is essentially I'm wrong. less worried. <laughs> less worried. <laughs> and who do you think is is the one most likely to come out of this uh, pool of alternative candidates. It's, impo campaign. it's impossible for me to know. I, I, I don't know. But I, I also I think that it's very difficult for us as a people to imagine the day after Netanyahu. That day will come, right? It'll come willingly. It will come because of a court decision or it will become because it will eventually lose an election, right? Uh, so one day or another, it's going to come and it will happen. And Israel will be fine, right? Israel will be fine for a number of reasons. We'll be fine because no one no country is dependent on one single individual. That's crazy as a thought. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's what Ron's saying. I'm saying that that's just the idea, and this is what you hear people in Israel say, if there's no alternative, is, is, is just, it's, it's ludicrous, right? Everyone has a replacement. Uh, Israel has strong institutions. Israel has a very powerful, most powerful military in, in the region, definitely and far beyond. Israel has uh, checks and balances. Israel has uh, the people who are running for this role. Some of them have significant cabinet experience and ministerial experience and legislative experience. Will it be Netanyahu? No. Might it be chaotic? Yes. But w w will we be fine? I, I have no doubt, right? And so I'm less concerned. And I'm, I'm actually more concerned of the fact, and you asked what we have to lose. What we have to lose is a lack of stability, continued political deadlock, the mudslinging that goes on and on and on, the divisiveness that has been created in division within Israeli society. This is all terrible for Israel. And this is, is, is eroding our social fabric, is what's been happening over the last two years of these nonstop election cycles. Do you think that... I, say, oh, I, go I, ahead, couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> ahead, everything Ron. you've said, I'm I surprised. have a complete opposite <laughs> view. Our institutions are 
borderline dysfunctional. <laughs> we have uh, this huge problem with the division of powers. You know, we have a crazy kind of a government uh, without, no one knows exactly who's in charge. And the court, of course, they think that they are completely in charge. And I think that Netanyahu plays a unique role in Israel's history. And I think that leadership sometimes does point you in the direction of an individual without whom things would, would have been very different. Now, I'm not, th- not saying that Netanyahu can't be replaced. I'm just saying that it would be a very a hard and cost, costly uh, transition once Netanyahu is gone because so much of the dysfunction of the Israeli government and the Israeli institutions are compensated by kind of good leadership decisions such as the vaccination campaign, which, you know, the inter- all the, administration, the administrators in Israel said this will not happen, which is why politicians said that too, because they said we relied on what, you know, po- officials Civil servants at the, the highest ranking order said that y- you can't vaccinate anyone until at least a year. And Netanyahu made the leadership decision that he's going that way and he's going to invest the, his entire capital on a vaccination campaign. And Israel has become the you know, most vaccinated country. Vaccination in the world. nation. And exactly. So, so I think this is exactly a place where you see where leadership counts and leadership makes a difference. And who is in charge makes the entire uh, history look different. I'm uh, so I, I place a lot of uh, you know, significance to to that. And again, I'm not saying he can't be replaced. And I'm definitely not saying that uh, he doesn't have faults. And uh, there are many things that I wish he would have done differently. But I think the kind of leadership that he presents and specific decisions that he took were crucial in Israel's history and are crucial during this time of crisis and the shift in uh, uh, American government. Now, in American elections, you you have basically a two-party system. The public votes directly for who will be the president of the United States against one other candidate or two or whatever. And you also have regional representation in the houses of the legislature. In Israel, we have, looking at the polls, maybe a 12-party system. Is it the system itself, this coalition parliamentary system that is the cause of such instability in Israel? I think it's definitely contributes greatly to it, right? The fact that you have all these small parties that all they need is to get three, three and a quarter percent of the votes and they cross the electoral threshold means that you have to create a hodgepodge of a government together to, uh, and, and pay out basically extortion money to, uh, to all the different little parties that are joining you, even if they're, they're small because you want to get and cobble together that 61 government. Um, I think we need to increase the electoral threshold significantly to be able to try to create more political stability, right? Bring all of these little parties together, if that's what they decide to do, but create a system that can have stability and can and can have staying power, right? As opposed to us finding ourselves going to elections at the, the greatest pace today in the world, almost. There, I, I don't think there's really uh, an answer a principled answer to that. It's uh, political systems are very different around the world, and uh, it's all very historical and circumstantial and societal. I mean, how people behave in a so, so Israeli the, the Israeli type of government worked for a significant period of time, but uh, undoubtedly it faces now. We are in two years of in crisis mode, political crisis mode, which is terrible. But uh, the American very different system also reached some sort of crisis mode. So it's uh, it's all very circumstantial and historical, of course. The crisis mode makes us want to change things, and it's, I think sometimes rightly, and I even agree with uh, raising the threshold, but uh, the system can work. It's mostly dependent on public opinion and the kind of behavior that politicians exhibit or are allowed to, to exhibit during their term. We have deteriorated in that, and we have to be more conservative, like we used to be in, uh, in government. One of the key issues that's happening to the Jewish people between Israel and the United States is that you see that there is a general shift in Israel to go toward the right, especially among younger people. And you see among American Jewry, the continued uh, sitting on the political left, and especially among younger people pushing even further to the left, more progressive than ever before. Can you explain why there is this difference between the way Israelis are shifting and the way Americans are shifting? And what are the threats that 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 those alternative shifts uh, have for the Jewish people come in the years ahead? 
Well, I mean, uh, just briefly from my perspective, Ron probably can talk about this more, but uh, I, I always question the uh, concept of Israelis moving more to the right. I think on diplomatic and security issues, that might be true. But I think if you look at social issues, right, you have more and more Israelis today who are more, you know, more accepting of LGBTQ, more, more speaking outwards, more of, uh, of separation of religion and state, right? Uh, more about social intervention and welfare, uh, right? So is it really that we're moving more to the right? Clearly on diplomatic and security we are, but on many other issues, I actually see a turn in the, in the other direction. So it's, it's, it's different. It, it's a little weird in that state. I think we have a problem with, with the Americans, right? And, and especially with American Jews in that sense, we're moving in, in seemingly sometimes opposite directions, right? They still talk about the Palestinians. No one here talks about the Palestinians. Palestinians are not even an issue in this upcoming election. It's as if they don't exist. And I think that that is something that, you know, you talk to an American Jew and they want to talk about the Palestinians, but we don't, we don't. So that creates this division that needs to somehow be bridged. Uh, I look at it a little bit differently. Of course, it's very hard to be succinct on that question because I, you know, I have, I've thought about it so much. Uh, I don't like the division right left. I would rather have a conservative and not, not conservative or, uh, or radical. Progressive, conservative, yeah, progressive. progressive. So I would say in, uh, in terms of nationalism and traditionalism, Israel is very conservative. In terms of national security and international relations, pretty conservative. But in terms of free market and limited government, we are not conservative, which is something that y you mentioned, and, and I agree with that. And I'm speaking about the public. But when you look at the, the shift, the shift is mostly ideological. The left has moved left. And what happened in the United States, I think that the left, those who voted left, moved with the ideology. They uh, became more radical. And in Israel, this didn't happen. The left went more radical since the 90s, basically. But the Israeli public remained just as it was. And what happened is that the left shrank from more than half of the Knesset member to something like 10%. Because the Israeli public didn't move, didn't have that ideological shift. Of course, there were some shifts, I, I agree, but not it, it, it didn't radicalize as much as the politics in the left radicalized. And in America, I think uh, the, the Jewish world, which uh, usually tended to vote democratic in large uh, margins, and they just remain that. They keep voting democratic and realizing or not that actually the democratic platform is radicalized in, in that time, but they don't change their, uh, I don't know, loyalty to the, to the branch. Well, Israel now has security threats as it has always had. We have economic threats. We have threats of political stability. Uh, yet at the same time, I think that Israelis do have a sense of optimism about where the country is going. Where do you think Israel will be 10 years from now? Probably still with Netanyahu as our prime minister. No. <laughs> um, I really don't. I mean, you know, I think that eventually uh, Iran will have to somehow be dealt with, right? So I think that, yes, we're strong. I, our economy will hopefully grow. We'll get, overcome the crises that we currently face. But when I look on the horizon and think of the existential challenges that we do potentially uh, have to confront, Iran is first and foremost, without a doubt, that the prime minister is 100% right that that is the greatest threat that we face. And it will have to be confronted head on. Now, whether there is a new deal or there is no new deal, it's something that's going to have to be dealt with. And, and, and that could change things for Israel. Well, it's very hard to predict, but I would say that Israeli trends are pretty good. We are a very happy nation, by the way, one of the yes. happiest nations uh, on the planet, right? We rank 10 or 12 uh, in the world, and we have very strong tra trends in economics and security. We are, we're doing a pretty good job. So that makes me optimistic. But of course, we are facing such an unknown, as you said, so many crises uh, you know, aligned uh, at one uh, point of time in history. So we have to be we're, we're worried, I would say. We have to be prepared, and we have to... Uh, focus our energies to uh, coming out of the, that crisis. We've done that, by the way, in two economic crises, 2000, 2008. Israel was less affected than other OECD countries. And I think we can do that again with the coronavirus. And we will have to do that, want or not, with the Iran crisis. And just talking about the future of Israeli conservatism, as is the, the name of the panel, with now a democratic president, a democratic senate, a democratic House of Representatives, it seems like America is sort of dropping the flag of conservatism. 
in the world. Does Israel pick up that banner? Is Israel now the state that waves the flag of conservatism? Ron, go ahead. Well, I would say something dramatic, but uh, I think it's true. I can, it's demonstrable. Factually, uh, I can show the facts. Israel is the leading OECD country in a developed country in combining kind of conservative society with uh, conservative views on, like I said, nationalism, tra traditionalism, etc., with a modern economy and a functioning government. Of course, we have the crisis, but a functioning modern government. So in that sense, we are, uh, we are primed to be the best in that for uh, coming years, I would say, pretty uh, a long period ahead because we are so well positioned to begin with. Okay, one word answer. Who is going to be the prime minister in the next <laughs> period? Who will be the prime minister? Netanyahu. I don't know. Okay. But there's a good chance it will be Netanyahu. Even if it's a fifth election, it's Netanyahu. So we, Correct. There, there are several scenarios in which Netanyahu is the prime minister and only one in which he is not. So I think Let's it's Let's put it this way. Bit. If I have to put money down right now, <laughs> Netanyahu stays as prime minister. Yaakov Katz, Ron Baratz, thank you so much for being thank with you us here much. at the Jewish Leadership Conference.